Okay. I think you're all coming in. I'm still seeing some little connecting signals. So I want to wait and let everyone have a chance to, to come together. I also got the first of likely many interruptions by my children. So welcome to Zoom. <laughs> Okay, well, hello everyone. It is so wonderful to see faces to put with the names that I've seen online and I'm so glad that we're all able to, to gather um, via Zoom. Uh, I, I wish we were doing our in-person lectures, but actually since we first did Community five years ago, we've had requests um, for a way for people to, to watch the lectures later or to join remotely. So um, one of the the few side effects, the positive bonuses of the pandemic is that we've had a chance to do that. We now have the capability of, um, of joining remotely and recording the lecture. So for those of you in the class, I'll be posting the lecture to ACE. Um, our wonderful speakers have given uh, me permission to do so. We are recording tonight's lecture. So if you do not want to be immortalized um, on screen, shared with the world uh, via the internet, you are welcome to turn your camera off. Um, and thank you. I see many of you have already muted yourselves. That really helps us with the sound quality um, so that we don't get interference. Um, so thank you for that. We will have an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so this will still be a dialogue and an opportunity to talk with our speaker. Um, and, and Dr. Martin will let you know when we're ready to take questions and you can unmute yourselves and we'll, um, we'll have a conversation. Um, so this is, as I said, our fifth community. I'm Dr. Jen Camden. I'm the Beverly J. Pitts Distinguished Professor of the Strain Honors College, uh, Professor and Associate Chair of English. And I also get the great privilege of coordinating this course. This started uh, as a Shaheen grant uh, with my colleague Kyoko Mano five years ago. Our first novel was Jane Austen's Emma. Uh, and we've had the wonderful opportunity to continue it since then. Our second novel uh, was Frankenstein in partnership with Indiana Humanities and their NEH funded One State, One Story. And since then, the Shaheen College of Arts and Sciences and the Department of English have supported our work. Um, and it wouldn't be possible without the generosity of my colleagues in the Shaheen College, like Dr. Martin, tonight's speaker, who volunteer to read a novel that they might not have otherwise read and bring their disciplinary expertise uh, to bear on that novel to share with all of us. So I'm, I'm really grateful for those collaborations. We also, every year since the Frankenstein Community have collaborated with Hullabaloo Press, our on-campus letterpress, and they have made beautiful letterpress posters uh, commemorating each of the lecture and performance series. Obviously with the pandemic, they have not been able to get into the shop in the same way that they have in the past. Um, but last year's community on Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe actually made a wonderful suggestion. They, they said they really wanted a, a bookmark or a book plate to commemorate having survived Scott's opus. Um, and so I took that to Catherine Fries in the College of Art and Design and her students, and that's what they're working on for this year. So the student artist, um, and I'm going to make sure I get her name correctly, is Ashley Andre. She's a senior art education major in advanced printmaking, and she has been working on this design that they are going to translate into a digital medium. The design is just completed today and has been sent to the um, technology expert to make it into something that you'll be able to print at home. So we'll be sharing that link through the A site for students in the course and also on the community website for those of you who are just coming in for the lectures so that you can print at home your um, bookmark to commemorate uh, this experience. Um, this is our fifth community. It's also our, our most enrolled community. So thank you, Dame Agatha, for bringing so many new people to, to the table. Um, Again, one of the few positive bonuses of the pandemic is that I've gotten to meet so many new friends, uh, so some, some many wonderful discussions, and I've, I've loved seeing in the online classes that many of you have come together with your pre-existing real-world book groups uh, and brought those into the community classroom. So I hope that you're having as much fun this semester as I am. Um, our upcoming lectures, also via Zoom, are on Monday, October 5th at 7 p.m. That'll be Dr. Milan Takar, um, whose background is international relations, but who gets credit for choosing Agatha Christie. Uh, he is a fellow Anglophile like me, and he's 
asked me for years when I would do Christy. And, and so when I discovered that this year was the 100th anniversary of the publication of our first novel, I said, okay, Melon, you know, we, we will finally do Christy. So he's going to share his um, wide ranging love and knowledge of Christy with us in October. And then in November, um, Monday, November 16th at 7 p.m., Dr. Jonathan Evans, who's a professor in the philosophy and religion department, another um, community university alumnus like Dr. Martin, um, is going to bring that kind of philosophical perspective to bear on the novel. And so I'm always um, delighted and surprised each year to discover how he's able to bring some of the questions philosophers debate um, to the ethics uh, and, and the moral compass of the novels we discuss. So it should be a great talk as well. Um, Dr. Chad Martin has graciously inaugurated our community university lecture series every year, uh, and he always brings wonderful, um, entertaining, sorry, no pressure, Chad, uh, <laughs> informative context to the novels that we discussed. Uh, I'm, I'm really always grateful that he leads us off because I know for myself, when I read a novel, one of my first questions is to understand um, the context in which it was written, the context in which it's set. Um, and so Dr. Martin always graciously does that work for us. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Chad Martin um, and I look forward to the talk. Thank you, Chad. You're welcome. Um, uh, thanks, Jen, for, uh, for asking me uh, back for another community university. I always look forward to these. Um, and this year, with things being so odd, <laughs> so strange, it's nice to have this as kind of a touchstone of normality. Like, yes, another community university. Um, although this is the first one I'll have done without wearing pants, uh, it's still, no, that's a joke. That's a joke. You'll take my word for it but I actually am clothed. Uh, but it, I will be a little less formal probably than my usual presentations just because of the format. What I wanna do here is give you guys kind of a broad overview of uh, what's going on in Britain at the time the novel was written, a little bit of background on sort of who Christy was and how she fits in. Uh, and then I wanna go through a series of, of images to give you some, some visuals for the world that, that you're gonna be engaging in in this novel. And uh, the hardest thing, of course, leading off these things is that when I start off uh, you know, as, as the lead talk, you guys have just started reading it. And so I have to try to give you context without giving away anything that happens. Um, now, in a book like Emma, nothing happens, so that wasn't a problem. Um, that's a dig at Dr. Camden, by the way. Um, but, in, <laughs> but in this book, it's a murder mystery, and so I'm going to try very hard not to, uh, not to give away who did it, um, whilst giving you some good information. Now, some background on the novel itself. Uh, the Mysterious Affair at Styles was uh, Christie's first published novel. Um, it was written in 1916. And uh, it's set, the action is set in 1917, uh, and it was actually not published until 1920. Um, so what is Great Britain in 1916, 1917? Um, to give you uh, just some very nuts and bolts stuff, like what's the world look like? Um, technology, well, there are automobiles, there are cars, but rich people are really the only ones who can afford them. A couple of them show up in the book, but most people still would use trains or, um, uh, just walk to get around. So if you're ever wondering why in the novel people are running around uh, uh, looking for people uh, rather than just jumping in their car like they would nowadays, it's because only the wealthy would have them. Um, likewise, telephones. Telephones had been invented, but again, they were very rare. Uh, they were mostly for cities. If you were in one part of London and you were wealthy, you could call your other wealthy friend in another part of London. But for the average person, they would be using telegrams, they would be using letters, uh, again, if you ever wonder why when they're like, get the doctor, somebody just doesn't just pick up the phone and call him, it's because in a remote location like rural Essex, where most of the action takes place in the novel, they simply wouldn't have had those kinds of things. Um, and as far as being a detective goes, fingerprints. They had started fingerprinting. Uh, Scotland Yard in 1901 begins to actually use fingerprints to catch criminals. Uh, so when uh, they begin you know, when Perot begins his detection, uh, that is sort of cutting edge for what he could do for the time. Now, as far as the bigger picture goes, um, we're looking at Great Britain in 1916 as one of the preeminent global powers. And it, it, it was coming off about 100 years of being the leading world power, basically from the defeat of Napoleon in 1815 to the start of World War I in 1914, that 99 year period is where Britain is really the hegemonic power in the world. Um, it 
uh, had the biggest empire the world had ever seen. It was the first country to have the Industrial Revolution, which gave it an immense amount of financial power. And there was a lot of cultural power that goes with this, right? Um, people looked to Britain for leadership, not just militarily and economically, but also culturally. So Christie really is, is becoming an author at a time when British literature and just Britain culturally in general had a lot of respect uh, and a lot of weight in the world. Uh, the bad part is that's going to come to a crashing halt very soon. Uh, the Ferret Styles is written at a time when Britain had peaked and was beginning its decline. And I don't know if I'm grabbing at straws here, but a little later in the talk, I'll tell you about how I feel like that, that affects the, the novel itself. Certainly, this was a time period where people looked back on it as the watershed moment of their lives, the First World War. We in America tend to think of the Second World War as this big event, but Britain actually lost more lives in the First World War than in the Second. And it was seen as the, the end of this glorious period of British dominance. Um, so that's kind of what's sort of going on in the in the wider world. Um, the, the, the British also were uh, aware, even at the time, that their time in the sun was, was, was fading. Uh, Germany and the United States were both catching up to Britain in, in economic power and might. Germany was a young country that had only unified in 1871. The U.S. had just finished its westward expansion in the 1890s and was starting to express its power globally for the first time. And so the British were remarkably insecure for having been on top for so long because they just knew they wouldn't, weren't going to be there for very much longer. And the First World War kind of puts up a, a, a nail in this coffin. Um, World War I breaks out in 1914. So by the time the novel is, is written, they're two years into the war. The novel is set three years, as I say, into the war. And it was the first European total war. Uh, it, this comes up all the time in the novel. Uh, Styles is referred to, for example, as a wartime household. And they, they emphasize the fact that um, they're no, they don't waste anything. You know, they, don't, they don't actually throw anything in the garbage. They're, they're, they're composting, they're recycling, they're, they're doing whatever they can, all for the war effort. Every resource in the country, whether it was manpower or whether it was material, was being harnessed to this great effort um, that went on year after bloody year. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the, the war is sort of this background. Um, you'll notice that almost every character relates to the war in one way or another. And I'll, I'll kind of go through and, and illustrate how they, do, how they do that a little bit later. Uh, another overarching thing you need to know about British history to make the novel make sense is the class structure of Britain. Um, British class structure has, by some people, been referred to as more of a caste structure. Uh, that is to say, you know, it's in America when we think of class, we think of income, how much money you've got. And so if you're poor and you suddenly strike it rich, you can become middle class or wealthy. In Britain, it, it's that, it's your wealth, but it also is your culture, your upbringing, your education, even things like your accent or how you use the English language that, that uh, can, can denote where you fit in the class structure. And it's really hard to shake that. You know, if you take a poor person and made them wealth, they still wouldn't have all the background to really, to really um, uh, uh, be the, 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 the class that their wealth would, would put them in. Uh, in this novel, the, the main characters are all from the upper middle class. Uh, they are what at one point would have been called the landed gentry, uh, which means that they, uh, they own this big estate styles, which, which is the source of their wealth and their influence in the surrounding community. They are the preeminent family. Everyone refers to the big house. The whole village kind of revolves around the big house and the people that own styles are expected to be the kind of community leaders. And you can see this when Mrs. Inglethorpe is, is arranging all these wartime functions at the beginning of the novel. She's speaking at, at events, she's raising money, she's coordinating the local war effort. And that was to be expected if you were the sort of local landed elite. Now, they're not nobles, they're not in the aristocracy, but they're kind of a step down from the aristocracy and they would know the local aristocrats. Uh, Mrs. Inglethorpe goes and hangs out with Lady Tadminster at a certain point, and that would have been the, 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 the local noble person, right? Um, and so these people are definitely at the top, the upper crust. One of the other giveaways is that none of them have jobs. I don't know if you noticed that, but, but you know, they, they basically dabble. They don't have to work for a living. Um, I mean, they can 
if they'd like to work. I mean, John trains as a barrister, but then eh, gives it up. He's bored. Lawrence trains as a doctor, but eh, he'd rather write bad poetry. Um, and so they all sort of uh, exist off this, this wealth that they inherited. And uh, of course, that's one of the the driving forces in the mystery, right? That who's going to inherit the wealth, right? There's this large amount of wealth, money, and land just sitting there. These people don't actually earn their money after all. They inherit it like the old fashioned way. And so who's going to get this wealth in the end is a big question. And you see some people from lower down on the social scale show up from time to time. The detective from Scotland Yard who shows up is from lower down on the social scale. You can tell by the way he, 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 he talks. Uh, and you can also tell by the fact that he actually has a job. He works for a living. Um, as do all the villagers and various other people you run into. There's the servants as well. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the, uh, the novel is, is sort of set in this kind of rarefied atmosphere. Uh, and it's a, a pretty accurate portrayal of what the social interactions from, from that class would be like at the time. And how does Christie fit into all this? She's exactly from this class. Um, she was born Agatha Miller uh, in 1890. Uh, her father was American. Uh, he was an American stockbroker. And she was raised upper middle class. Uh, her, uh, she was educated at home uh, and in uh, French boarding schools and then married her husband, Archie Christie, which is where her last name comes from, who was an officer in the British Army. Uh, by the time she's writing the novel in uh, 1916, he's actually serving in the Royal Flying Corps, uh, which was, this is the, World War I is the first war where you had air forces, and her husband, Archie, was uh, in the, what would later become the British Air Force, the RAF. Um, and so she, she's very much part and parcel of this upper middle class world. Uh, in fact, her and her husband actually met at a party thrown by the Baron and Lady Clifford, uh, which gives you an idea that just like Mrs. Inglethorpe, they would, you know, rub elbows with the local nobility. Uh, and in fact, that's where they met and, and ended up getting married. Now, this leads me to a problem, a personal problem, which Dr. Camden is well aware of is that in 19th century literature, I generally hate novels written about upper middle class people. Because in 19th century literature, they pretty much ignore the fact that they are more or less a parasitic class at the top of a very unjust social structure. And all the people who are toiling away 10 hours a day in factories and mines to make their Make, the, make it so they can sit around and do no work. Those people get written out of the novels and just painted disappear. And so you get all these people basically sitting around with nothing more to worry about than who they're going to marry. And that's my common complaint, which Dr. Camden has heard ad nauseum for the past five years. So why do I like this book? Why do I like this book so much if it is a book that really is about the upper middle class to the exclusion of almost everyone else? And this is where I get to the point I was going to make about Christie being an atypical member of the upper middle class and how I think she's kind of picking at them a little bit. Um, for one, Christie in her own life just didn't fit into this world very well. Um, her uh, original ambition when she was young was to be a concert pianist uh, and she was evidently quite good, but she had stage fright. She was very nervous and awkward. Uh, part of her awkwardness came from the fact that she was homeschooled. She just wasn't socialized very well, didn't know how to interact with people very well. And this was at a time when if you were an upper middle class woman, you were expected to be very gracious. You were expected to be, have a lot of social skill. Uh, Mary Cavendish in the book is the epitome of the proper upper middle class woman, what you're supposed to be. Beautiful, vivacious. You're supposed to walk into a room, men's heads turn. You're supposed to make all the social interactions very comfortable. That was not Agatha Christie. That was just not who she was. That was not how she was hardwired. Um, maybe because she felt a little awkward about all this, she decides that she can basically not take a part, but poke at the system that doesn't give her a lot of other options for her life, for how to behave. Um, she was not uh, a particularly political person. She, as far as I can tell, took no real interest in the fight for women's suffrage, which uh, was really in the forefront of the time uh, that the book was written. Women in Britain, just like women in the United States during World War I were still unable to vote and were, had been fighting for years to get that right to vote. They both achieved the right to vote at about the same time, Britain in 1918 and the United States, as you probably know, 100 years ago this year. Um, but Christie seems to have not really taken much interest in that struggle. Uh, she also wasn't very interested in politics. It was a really politically tumultuous era. One of the major political parties was self-destructing during the war and another major, major political party was being born during the war. And again, Christie seemed to take very little interest in any of that. 
but that's not to say she wasn't a trailblazer in a lot of ways. Uh, if you look into her life, she is really remarkable, not just for being a uh, successful woman author writing under her own name and making a commercial killing at it, um, but she did all these other kinds of just odd things. She traveled the world. Uh, she, um, she surfed. I didn't know that until I started looking into this. She was one of the first women surfers. You can go online and find pictures of her with a surfboard. It's very strange. Not exactly the thing the proper prim upper middle class woman was expected to do, right? So to, de to defend my assertion that she kind of picks away at the upper middle class while also writing about them and actually being from the, that very class. Um, one of the things is if you look at uh, a lot of 19th century literature, the upper middle class is portrayed as kind of the 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 moral backbone of Britain. They're upstanding. They're the the men are, are dashing, heroic, and self-sacrificing. Uh, the women are are demure and retiring, but still with a spine of steel. Uh, they're in many ways considered, you know better than the aristocrats who are considered sort of, you know, a little bit foppish and, and probably not as uh, determined as they should be, and certainly better than the uneducated masses beneath them. But here comes Christy, and obviously the people she's portraying in this novel aren't really morally or intellectually superior to anyone. Um, just as an example, when Mrs. Inglethorpe dies, and I hope I'm not giving anything away here that, that there's going to be a murder, um, but when Mrs. Inglethorpe dies, one of the first things that you realize is that no one much cares. Uh, there's not a lot of mourning. It's not like, a, oh, we've lost this great lady. It's just kind of a collective shrug. And maybe she puts it in there so the murder won't really bum you out as the reader. You're kind of like, yeah, this lady died, but yeah, she wasn't great. But I think it's really telling that the, the woman whose life is supposed to be at the center of this rural community is completely unloved by all the people around her, with the sole exception, perhaps, of her, uh, of her husband, Alfred. But the same, I think that's a really telling thing. The other side of that, of course, is that once the murder happens, pretty much every leading suspect is also from the upper middle class. These people aren't above suspicion. They aren't considered inherently moral or superior. They could be, you know, poison wielding murderers for all we know. And for most of the novel, we don't know. And they're all likely candidates. They all have reasons, selfish, despicable, backstabbing reasons for wanting to get rid of this woman who they profess to be close to. And many of them are related to. So or some of them are related by marriage too. So I just love that, that, that this cl social class that had been held up as this sort of avatar of, of British respectability in this uh, novel becomes all deeply suspicious. Um, likewise, uh, the, the narrator, and I'm going to come back to this because I think it's so wonderful. The narr narrator Hastings is such a wonderful narrator because there's so much unintentional, from his perspective, unintentional comedy that comes out of him because he's not very smart and he's not very per perceptive and he's sort of a walking uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, which is this, this study they said that, peop there's, they're, they're, that people tend to, who, who are not very smart or who don't know very much, don't realize that about themselves. They walk through the world assuming that they're as smart as they think they are. And as you read this novel, how many times is it that he cannot figure out what Perot is getting at? How how many times is it that clues that Perot finds are right in front of his face? And he talks all the time about, oh, you know, I'm quite perceptive. I thought about becoming a detective myself because I have a keen mind. And as you're reading, you keep saying over and over again, I don't think so, Hastings. Uh, your mind's not all that sharp. Um, and again, he's the upper middle class guy. Uh, wouldn't you think that if he would be a little bit sharper and a little bit brighter? Not really. Which leads to the final point, which is, the truly intelligent person, the truly sharp person who's going to unravel all of this isn't even British. Not is he not only not upper middle class, he's not even British. He's Belgian, right? How much more of an indictment of the British uh, upper middle class do you need that they can't even, that, that they're potential murderers and they can't even figure out their own crimes. They need to bring in a foreigner to do their business for them. Um, so that's kind of my, 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 my uh, 10,000 foot uh, percept, uh, uh, background on this. Um, I want to switch now and give you a series of images to kind of uh, highlight uh, the, uh, the action in the novel. And uh, this is going to require me to do some technology. So let's see if I can do it and not break anything. All right, there we go. The woman of the, of the hour, that is young Agatha Christie, in case any of you were wondering. Um, what she looked like. Uh, I'm not saying that you can you can see some some of the awkwardness there, but that's that's just uh, the the author herself. Um, hold on a second. Let me see if I can. 
OK. Um, in case you're wondering what styles might look like, you have a couple of maps and everything. This is Agatha Christie's childhood home. Um, she grew up in Devon, which is actually on the opposite coast from Essex, where the action is set. But this gives you an example of the kind of upper middle class house that uh, that styles would have been. Um, it's complete with, if you can see it here, a solarium, quite, quite nice. Um, this is a house that Agatha Christie uh, grew up around as a kid and she loved it. It was also in Devon and she would drive past it and, uh, and, and loved it. And she eventually, when she had made her money from her novels, bought it. So if the, the picture you previously saw was the house she grew up in, this is the house she lived uh, the rest of her, her successful life in. And again, I think it's a, a pretty good model for what styles would look like. A classic country house, quite spacious, um, extensive gardens and grounds. It would obviously take a lot of help to, um, to take care of, of something this big. Uh, one of my favorite bits about the novel, one of my favorite moments in the novel, which for you guys, I'm sure just is gonna pass by without comment, but for me, it's where they're complaining about how they used to have five gardeners and now they've only got three gardeners and one of them's a woman and how sad it is. And Perot's like, don't worry, good times will return again. I'm here to tell you good times aren't gonna return. Um, after World War I, um, the, 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 the great lie of shows like Downton Abbey is that people liked being servants nobody liked being a servant. And as soon as factory jobs become more plentiful during World War I, all the people that had in the past gone into service decided I would much rather work an eight to 10 hour day at a factory and then go home than you know, clean for somebody else and cook for somebody else. So uh, those good times at Styles weren't gonna come back. <clears throat> and actually houses like this became incredibly difficult to maintain after World War I because the, you needed an army of servants to take care of them. And because servants became so much more expensive after the war, um, they, they started to disappear. And the other thing that happened was that uh, during the war, Britain basically went bankrupt. Um, they had been the wealthiest nation on earth and they had to basically sell off their wealth to pay for the cost of the war. They went deeply into debt, uh, especially to American bankers like JP Morgan and other investors uh, as a nation. And then after the war to help to pay off these debts, they had to raise taxes. And the only people that had any kind of money were people like the people that lived in this house. And so they began to tax the wealthy to pay down their war debts and it became the, the, the double whammy of increased taxation and expensive servants made houses like these really sort of begin to disappear. So Styles, the Mysterious Fair at Styles is interesting because it, it captures, uh, you know, this this landed gentry in their kind of, like I said, sort of last moment of, last moments of uh, easy living. This is uh, Agatha and her husband, Archie. And you can see him in his, uh, World War I army uniform, his uh, long trench coat and uh, cap as a pilot in the uh, Royal Flying Corps. Now, uh, one of the things about Britain's involvement in World War I uh, that comes to bear on the novel is that uh, World War I starts on August 4th, 1914. And uh, the question was, would Britain get involved? Britain had, mm, alliances with Russia and with France, who had both by that point declared war on Germany. But the British were still sort of hesitant about whether they wanted to commit to war. All through the, the 19th century, Britain had avoided any kind of uh, military entanglements and had uh, been kind of an independent operator preferring to throw its weight behind whichever side in any conflict uh, looked weakest so that they could maintain a balance of power and prevent warfare. And so they, they hadn't really been you know, obliged to any, any one country or another. Uh, and there's this question of would they get involved in World War I now that the shooting had started. And they do, the reason they do, the reason the, the, the British government gives to the British people is because of Belgium. Uh, hence, bravo Belgium, because when the war starts on August 4th, it starts because the Germans invade Belgium uh, so they can go around the French border, which they knew was heavily fortified, and into France to try to launch a quick knockout blow against the French. And the poor Belgians, who were neutral, uh, basically were a speed bump along the road for the Germans. And this violation of Belgian neutrality was considered by the British to be really, you know, beyond beyond evil. You, you, they, 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 the British had long... Uh, uh, close relations with the Belgians. Belgium was the natural 
port for any British trade with Europe uh, right across the English Channel. And so there's this great sort of uh, pathos around Brit uh, Belgian participation in the war. So here's Bravo Belgium. Enlist today, remember Belgium. Remember Belgium. Um, this brings up another thing where you can see the, the German soldier there has just killed a woman and her baby. And he's got a bloody bayonet to show for it. Um, this was, there was a whole uh, uh, mythos around the rape, what they called the rape of Belgium. Uh, the Germans, when they invaded Belgium, the small Belgian army, heavily outnumbered, fought tenaciously for a lot of the war. Um, large parts of Belgium were occupied by the German military. This is an American painting about German atrocities in Belgium. You see this guy getting his hands cut off. One of his hands is already on the ground. And this woman behind him is having God knows what happened to her. And there's another woman dead on the ground in front of you. Um, so because this was considered what was happening in Belgium, these horrible German atrocities, there were Belgian refugees who are admitted to Britain to basically stay out the war, right? And hence Perot. If you're ever wondering, well, why is there a group of Belgian guys hanging out in this village, and Perot's one of them, um, this is where it comes from, right? The, the British, also it, it helps to explain why there's a couple of times in the novel where people refer to foreigners with kind of, you know, just where, where they don't really like them, like, ah, this is foreigners, foreign ways. It's typically British. They're an island, they're insular. They, they basically look down their nose at at all kinds of basically anybody that's not British, um, including the Irish. Uh, but uh, but the Belgians they gave a pass to. They they basically, as you can see in the novel, they'll say, oh yeah, but those Belgians they're so brave, right? And so this is this is where this comes from. Also, I think it's interesting uh, that at, at one point Perot is described as having a limp, um, and I think that's Christie's way of indicating why he's not serving in the Belgian military, because uh, like I said, the Belgians were continuing to fight this desperate fight for this little corner of their country they were able to hold on to. Uh, but Perot was exempted from military service, I would assume, because he's 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 an invalid, uh, and so that's that's the little little the, the the weird role Belgium plays in the book. Oh yeah, in Belgium, help. All right, uh, this is an, a, a painting of uh, British Army officers. These are, in particular, the general staff officers of World War I. And I point this out because, as I've said, Hastings is not very bright, and, but thinks he is. And I don't know that she's doing this as a commentary, but it really does read nowadays as a commentary because uh, the saying in the First World War was that the British Army was an army of lions led by donkeys. And what they meant by that was that the average British soldier, this working class guy who maybe worked in a factory or worked in a coal mine before the war, was brave and courageous and patriotic. But the officers leading him were all a bunch of upper middle class and aristocratic idiots. And over and over again in the war, they sent these brave working class guys to certain death, battles like the Somme, where 20,000 men die in just the very first day of the battle. And they don't learn anything because they're donkeys. They just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again for four years, getting more and more and more brave men killed. Um, now, again, I'm not sure that she portrays Hist Hastings as not that bright, but thinking he's very bright because she wants to throw these guys under the bus. But I think it is interesting that Hastings, when we first meet him, has been invalided from the front, which means he's been wounded and has been sent home to recuperate. Uh, this was what was known in the trenches as getting a blighty wound. It meant that you were wounded bad enough, they would send you back to Britain. Um, and then, at the, uh, and I'm not really giving anything away, at the end of the novel, he's joined the, the general staff. He's at the war office, which means he would be working with these guys in this painting. Uh, one of my favorite little tidbits about little trivia facts about these guys is, is if you notice, you can tell they're a staff officer because they wear red piping on their collars and on their hat bands. And that was a dead giveaway that they were staff officers because nobody who was actually going to do any fighting would go into combat wearing bright red, right? Uh, and so it basically meant they were safe behind their desks, sending other men off to do the, 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 the killing and the dying. Um, again, I don't know that she meant to portray Hastings as, as kind of a, a, a not that bright guy because the British Army officers in this war were considered kind of dull. But nevertheless, I think it's interesting. Um, Oh, here's a note, beware of spies. I'm not gonna say anything more about that, just spies were a thing. Um, there were during uh, World War I about 120, we, from sources we can 
put together now, about 120 German agents were operating inside Great Britain, of whom about 31 were captured. Um, you also had people like uh, Sir Roger Casement, who was uh, attempting to help the Irish rebels during the war with German assistance. You know, funny thing, uh, they, they caught Casement because he was uh, brought to shore in a U-boat and he stumbled out, his boat overturned when he was rowing to the shore from his U-boat and he stumbled out uh, soaping, sopping wet and covered in mud and that was kind of the dead giveaway. So nothing more to say about that, we'll just move along. Um, now, it says that Styles is a, a British, is a war household. Uh, this is what a war household means, right? You were continually reminded during the war effort that every last thing that you could do to save and conserve would go towards the eventual victory. Uh, you know, don't waste bread. Save two thick slices every day and defeat the U-boat. Um, the U-boat that I mentioned a second ago, these are submarines, what we would call a submarine. The Germans, being very literal people, uh, called them U-boats because U-boat meant under the sea. So under the sea boat. Like I said, a very literal people are Germans. Um, and what was happening during the war was that ships that were coming to Britain to bring food in from the colonies like Australia and New Zealand or from the United States were being sunk by these German submarines and hence there were food shortages. There were shortages of pretty much everything. Um, and so uh, Styles being a war household, they were supposed to conserve every last thing they could. Um, also, Britain mobilized women during the war in a huge way. And this comes up in the case of a lot of women in the novel, right? Mrs. Englethorpe, as I mentioned before, is giving speeches and rallying the local people to the war effort, raising money for war bonds and, and, and having scrap drives and all that. Cynthia Murdoch uh, is uh, working as a Red Cross nurse, which you see a World War I Red Cross nurse right there. And Mary Cavendish is working on the land, as they say, uh, as they say in the novel. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. In case you're wondering, who is this striking woman in her Red Cross hospital outfit? It's Agatha Christie. Um, this is Agatha Christie's wartime service record. Um, you can see here that she was engaged as a nurse from October 1914, and then she worked as a dispenser, which means that she is Cynthia Murdoch. Uh, she worked as a Red Cross nurse and then worked as in a dispensary uh, dispensing medicine, and uh, basically exactly what Cynthia does um, in the novel, which makes it so surprising that Cynthia ends up being the killer. No, I told you I wouldn't give anything away. That's a joke. Um, now, uh, uh, this does, by the way, uh, play into the novel, in, into a lot of her novels, because just as when you go to Cynthia's dispensary in the novel, you see that there is a cabinet full of poisons. Um, becoming a, a, going from a nurse to a dispenser, Agatha Christie had to pass examinations about various medicines and things, and she learned all about poisons and their effects. So in the novel, when she's talking about, you know, how long would it take for strychnine to kill somebody? How long would it take for that? I mean, that's not something she just looked up in a book. She actually was trained in that uh, and was putting that training to use when she sat down to write the novel. Write what you know, I suppose, and that's what she knew. Uh, here's actually a, a group photo of her and all the other people who worked at the hospital in Torquay where, um, where, she, was, uh, where she was stationed. Now, I mentioned uh, the, uh, 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 Cynthia Murdoch is obviously working as a Red Cross nurse. Mary Cavendish, they never use the term woman's land army in the novel, but that is definitely what she's doing. Um, the Woman's Land Army, the idea here was that all these men are being drafted into the military and suddenly you're going to need women to do a lot of work that had previously been men's work. If you lived in the cities, you were encouraged to go work in factories. And in fact, uh, there was a whole um, group of women called the Munitionettes, uh, which were women who worked in munitions factories, uh, making explosives, making artillery shells. Uh, if you lived in the rural area, like Mary, uh, you were encouraged to go and work the land um, because, as I say, there are desperate food shortages in the country and, um, and they needed everybody they could, man or woman, to go out there and do this. And so Mary, even though she's very refined, middle class, upper middle class woman, uh, is patriotic. Everybody, and a lot of people, the Cavendishes are relatively patriotic. John is training with the volunteers, which, you know, is neither here nor there, but, but Mary's out there, you know, working away. Here's a... Uh, uh, actual photograph of a land army uh, woman out there working away. You might notice this is just a, again, you don't have to pay any attention to this. I'm just going to throw it out there as a, as a little, uh, uh, a little trivia fact. You might notice she's wearing an armband. 
right there, a little armlet. That's what they look like, in case you're wondering what the armband of a land army woman would look like. I'm not saying it, you need to know, but just in case you were curious, that's what they look like. Um, so that's, my, that's the end of my little uh, visual presentation, hopefully uh, bringing back to you some, uh, bringing to you some of the um, uh, uh, visuals for this, um, for this uh, novel. And at that, I'm more than happy to take some questions if you have any, um, about the novel in general, British history in this era in particular. Um, I teach a class in British history if you're a student and you want to know more. So we do have one question. How, how was the novel uh, received initially? Oh, um, well, it, it's, 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 uh, uh, it took her, I think, four tries to get it published. Like I said, she wrote it in 1916, uh, doesn't get it published until 1920 because she submitted it to multiple publishers before she finally found one that would that would take it. But it was well reviewed. Uh, you know, it's 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 got all the the marks of of Christie. This kind of intricate plot that all these pieces that in the end fit together. You know, leaves you guessing until the the, the final act. Who who there's a, there's a lot of uh, of of suspects who are you know perfectly within the realm of reason. Uh, and so there's no kind of like pulling the wool out from interview at the end. Um, and so, oh, hello. It's a nice little, <laughs> little guest appearance there. Um, and so uh, uh, it was it was well received. It's, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say that it made her reputation, but it's the beginning of her reputation. You know what I'm saying? She was, she was, she was obviously gonna be able to publish more and more uh, as a result of the success of it. Okay, so they didn't exactly pick up on maybe some of the little uh, subtle digs that were uh, being taken on 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 their own class. Then. Well, I mean, I, it's interesting because by the by the time the by the time the the, the novels published, the the readership, middle class people certainly would have read it, but a lot of working class people would have read it too. And I think that's the interesting thing is that you know, as a working class reader, because um, the the language isn't particularly complicated and it's a good page turning thriller, so there's no reason a working class audience wouldn't take to it. And even though you wouldn't see yourself in it. What what what's better as a working class person than to see the people above you sort of poked at, you know? Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? I I have a question, and I I don't know if it's an English question or a history question. So, um, seeing as it was written in the same time period as it was set. I have always wondered about um, the language used within the book and particularly how conversations went because there's many layers. It are, is the conversation written in a way that people really spoke to each other in a way that um, using words and phrases that were popular in the time or was it written in a tone that was expected of the time period to be able to be considered a proper novel. Well, I, I'll let I'll let Jen take part of it, but I'll I'll just because I think she's obviously the literature expert. But I, I will say that um, there's a there's a real difference between this novel and some of the, the novels that would, were, were written, you know, a century before. You're starting to get colloquialisms come in a lot more. I mean, you can, like I said, you can really tell when the detective from Scotland Yard enters the scene and he's much more kind of earthy and uses different kinds of expressions than the upper middle class people that you're, you're used to when Dorcas is being interviewed, the servant, again, her language is different. So I, I think Christie did try to, ca is, you know, capture the, 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 the speech patterns of, of people from different from different classes. I don't know, Jen, what do you have anything to say about that? Sorry, it took me a while to find the unmute button. Um, that's a great question, Abigail. You know, when I remember being in grad school and talking about movies and we would we would call them film school films because the characters are always having these very deep and intense conversations that are perfectly crafted. And so I think there's always an element of that in a novel, right? That the author um, has the luxury of revising what her characters are going to say to one another. So they're always gonna be a better conversation than you're gonna have on your average Tuesday. Um, that being said, I think as, as Dr. Martin said, we can see that progression 
Um, you know, certainly Shakespeare and Dickens, I mean, throughout history, there have been authors who represent characters from different classes, but um, it can tend to feel maybe with a bit more caricature than you see as we as we see um, in, in 20th century novels, right? That there's more of, um, there are more interactions between characters of different classes. I don't think we've, maybe we've gotten there yet. Um, we, we find out that Mrs. Inglethorpe has asked some of the gardeners to witness her will. That doesn't give away any of the, of the whodunit, but we, we start to see interactions among characters that you wouldn't necessarily see see before. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I hope it, it does a little bit. Well, I, I, would, I would throw in as well, um, you talked about film. Uh, th there's there's uh, one of my favorite uh, directors from the 1940s, 30s and 40s, is a guy named Howard Hawks. And Howard Hawks became famous because he was the first director to actually record conversations in movies that felt natural, where people would talk over each other, people would interrupt each other. And, and so you're watching a Howard Hawks film, like His Girl Friday is one of his most famous, right? Mm -hmm. You're watching a movie like that, and, and people are, are constantly talking like real people talk. And I kind of feel like Christie does a, a, a decent job of that, where you'll have people who are having conversations, and they're talking past each other, they're interrupting each other. Uh, Perot will, will continually have little sort of ejaculations like, oh, whoa, ah, you know, and, and Hastings will be like, what are you talking about? He's like, mm, nothing, I'll tell you later. And, and you know, that, that, that is not as sort of scripted as a lot of more formal, older literature, that, at least that I've read. I mean, those kind of more, those little beats you get in conversation. It's not like, 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 like Dr. Camden said, it's not, it's not conversation because no literature is conversation, but, but I think she does add these little nuances in there that I'm, I, haven't, I, don't, I don't see a lot of, at least in 19th century stuff. Chad's going to cringe, but the um, new adaptation of Emma, one of the, we can have a much longer conversation about that at another time when Dr. Martin doesn't have to sit through it. Um, one of the things I love about it is the director has the characters talk over one another and it, you mm -hmm. know, tend to think of Austen novels as like, oh yes, I've said my piece and I will wait for you to say yours, but she, I think she does a really nice job of bringing that dialogue to life in the way that it would have happened in, in real time. Other questions for Dr. Martin? Or for me, I guess I'm here. To... <laughs> How does this kind of compare like, well, the very first of the detectives was like the Wilkie Collins. Yeah, we we did that novel. Were you did you did you do that one with us in university? No, I think I read it in high school or something thrilling like that. But that's been about sixty years ago, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, unsu unsurprisingly, when I was doing my background research on Christie, she was a fan of Wilkie Collins. She was a fan of the Moonstone, which how could you not be? I mean, how do you, you, know, you don't you yeah. don't you don't you don't arrive at this fully for you don't you don't spring you know from Zeus's head fully formed you know you have to build up to that. And I, it's not unsurprisingly she was a fan of the book. Yeah, I remember reading it. And I think I liked it better than the Woman in White. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I have some students who agree with you, Carol. <laughs> 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 I've taught both, and I I love them both dearly. Um, so those of you who are not around for our community on the Moonstone. It's a great page turn of a read, you know, um, foreign jugglers, opium addiction, a massive oh, yes. diamond, a great country house. Like it's got everything yeah. you need in a, in a yeah. thrilling novel. My, my um, one criticism of Christie is not enough hashish. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hashish shows up in Moonstone as a prime thing, right? And not here, sadly, not here. She was a teetotaler. To be truth, to truth be told. So, not even not even a stiff brandy for Mrs. Christie. How about the ever mysterious Edwin Drood? Has she sure is in that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if we're gonna if we're gonna talk hashish just for a second here, because you got me on a on a, on a roll here, um, <laughs> right right before uh, th th uh, this time period there was a lot of detective fiction and you all know Sherlock Holmes and all that. One of my favorite subgenres was there what they called the psychic, the psychic detective. And so uh, William Hope Hodgson and Alderman Blackwood would write these detective novels that are very much like 
um, very much like a, a Sherlock Holmes, except for there's, there's a supernatural element in it. There's ghosts or there's conjuring and all that. And one of the guys that wrote that was a guy named Arthur Macon. He wrote um, some supernatural uh, detective stories. And his first book was called Confessions of an English hashish eater, which was uh, a riff on De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, right? Uh, and so there, I can connect anything back to hashish given a little time. That's my, that's my proof of that. Yeah, that, that sounds kinda, really, oh, I'm sorry, Carol, go ahead. I find it kind of interesting that she was a um, Red Cross nurse in World War I. Actually, I went into the profession myself because my mother had an aunt who was in the American contingent that went over and she was a surgical nurse in a field hospital. Wow. Well, you know, a lot of a lot of Americans volunteered for Red Cross service uh, even before the U.S. got into the war. The U.S. doesn't get into World War One until April of 1917, but a lot of people, including quite a few famous authors, uh, Hemingway being the most famous, mm -hmm. Um, served in various Red Cross contingents even before the U.S. entered the war, and so um, yeah, it was a, it was it was a, a really big deal. Um, and of course, you know, World War One had such horrific casualties that the whole field of nursing changed. Um, the French invented triage. If you've ever heard the term triage, the French invented triage as a way of rapidly handling the massive casualties that came that came their way. Now, uh, Agatha Christie didn't deploy overseas. She was she was stationed in, in Britain itself for the war. But, you know, there were a lot of, you know, if you were wounded in combat, your first stop would have been a field hospital to get your immediate wounds taken care of and to see if you were going to live or die. But then if you had a blighty wound, as they called it, a wound bad enough to be sent home, like Hastings in the novel, then you'd be sent to a hospital like the one that uh, Cynthia in the book or Agatha Christie in real life uh, worked at. Anybody else? You were talking about the changes after World War I. The only book I can think of, and I never could quite finish it, was uh, about Mrs. Dalworthy. <laughs> Mrs. Dalworthy, <laughs> the terrible Virginia Woolf book. <laughs> Not a Virginia Woolf fan, huh? No, I think it, the only thing that was fascinating was that when she, you know, would try to put all these characters together. And all I remember was this woman's main aim in life was giving parties. <laughs> you sound like a woman after my own heart. Yeah, all these idle rich people. Yeah. But um, if you want to read Vera Britton's Testament of Youth is considered one of the classic war memoirs uh, from a woman's point of view. And, um, and there's a bunch of history written about this, um, about the, what happens after the war. And the, the, there's uh, David Canadine, is a great British historian who wrote a book called The Decline and Fall of the British Aristocracy. And he really traces uh, the decline of this like leisured country living and the, 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 the landed wealth and how really in the 20th century, it's just they take one hit after another um, until, uh, until finally that lifestyle becomes un, uh, basically, un, you can't, you can't, you just can't live to that standard anymore. And I, for one, am happy because uh, I would much rather <laughs> I'd much rather the average person have access to health care than a handful of twits sit around their big house <laughs> doing no work at all. So just to briefly speak in defense of Mrs. Dalloway, for those of you um, who've read The Hours or seen the movie, that's a retelling of the Mrs. Dalloway story. And it does feature one of the early representations of um, PTSD, right? It's got a character from yes. the war front. And I think that's what prompted you to think of it, Carol. Um, well, I, it's, it's, worth, it's worth pointing out, um, uh, at the time, they didn't call it PTSD. They called it shell shock. Yes. And um, there's a, the, 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 it doesn't show up in this book at all. And there's no reason it would. But probably the most famous writers to come out of the war are the so-called trench poets. And so if you're interested in World War I literature, uh, you've got these guys who literally were junior officers, lieutenants, first lieutenants, captains, who were in the trenches fighting. And then I mean, strange as it seems, in between battles would sit in their bunkers and write poetry. And so you had Siegfried Sassoon and uh, Will, uh, William Blunden and uh, Wilfred Owen, probably the most accomplished of the poets, although he dies right before the war ends, and Robert Graves. And then mm -hmm. they all were suffering from PTSD. And in fact, uh, 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 Sassoon and Owen both went to the same hospital in, in Britain for, for, for their PTSD, for their shell shock. They, they had to go through psychotherapy and they both ended up returning to the front lines 
uh, and Owen, as I say, gets killed uh, after returning to the front lines after having a nervous breakdown. And then the ones that live after the war, about 10 years after the war, and I find this very, very interesting that generally people who survive combat take about 10 years to process it before they begin to um, really write about it. But there's a series of novels and memoirs that come out. So you've got A Goodbye to All That by Graves, you've got Memoirs of an Infantry Officer by Siegfried Sassoon, and you've got, oh, what's, what's a Blunden's book? I can't remember the name of Blunden's book, but they're, they're really great reads. And, and they, they, they do testify to what I was saying earlier about the the belief that the British Army was don lions led by donkeys. Uh, if you read Sassoon's poetry, uh, he has uh, a poem about how he's uh, marching, you know, about uh, how he's marching past these cheering civilians, and he dreams about launching a bayonet charge against them, against his own people, because he's so he feels like they've they've taken his whole generation and forced them through jingoism and and nationalism into a pointless war. So it's uh, not for the lighthearted. <laughs> Not an uplifting tale, but if you're if you're interested in the literary side of World War One, there's a lot to dig into. Yeah, I can't go to the World War Memorial in Indianapolis. Those of you who live in Indianapolis um, will know that there's that building that just says World War Memorial because no one thought we could ever go through that again. And there's a statue in front of it, um, this you know kind of heroic figure with a cape. And at the bottom it says Pro Patria. And every time I see that, I think of Wilfred Owen's poem, Dulcet to Coromast, right? And if you haven't read it, yeah. you, can, you can look it up and, and then you'll get the joke of the last line. <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking briefly of the war poets, you know, we talk so much about the poets of the first war and we see so little of that in the second war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. some novels, but it just, it just doesn't have the same... Uh, kind of output that the first war gave us? I, you know, if you're curious about that, you have to read uh, Fussell's book, mm -hmm. um, The Great War in Modern Memory. I don't know if you've read it, but he, Fussell, uh, who was a veteran of World War II and then became a literary critic, uh, writes all about the trench poets, a whole book about the trench poets. And throughout the book, he keeps talking about how my generation, he's talking about the World War II generation, couldn't produce this and, and, and why it is, what had changed between the two world wars to make it impossible for his generation to produce their own version of trench poetry. And so, uh, mm. so yeah, Fussell's The Great War in Modern Memory. If you can get the illustrated edition, even though it's out of print, because it has great, 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 uh, uh, yeah, artifacts and paintings and everything else that really, really highlight the text very well. Anything else? We've kind of gone off script here. We're kind of, we kind of went down a, a rabbit hole about for the war. Anybody have any Christy, <laughs> any Christy questions or uh, any? Well, uh, I have a little bit of a hybrid. It's war related and Christy <laughs> slash mystery related. Um, Dorothy Sayers, I know that like, um, Lord Peter Whimsey was also World War I yes. um, vet, but I feel like the timing of her novels was a little bit later than Agatha Christie. Um, I feel like, they, I don't remember exactly, I've read them all, I don't remember when, but I'm just curious about her and also um, Ngaio Marsh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce her first name, but the other yeah. writer from that time period. I will let Jen take this. Yeah, so I, my mom has read a lot of March. I haven't, but I have obsessively read the Sayers novels. And, you know, um, she and, and Christy were both members of the Detection Club, kind of this self-formed club of mystery writers that crafted a series of rules that they agreed to abide by. Um, and those are, those are widely available on the internet. And in some sections, those have been posted in the, in the Stylites Arms form. So, yeah, so, uh, Sayers and, and Christy are relatively contemporary with one another. Um, and, you know, some of those rules have not stood the test of time particularly well. My, my neighbor who's in the course, Tom Osterman, pointed out that no Chinaman allowed is, is kind of a, a strange one that doesn't sit well uh, with modern readers. And I think what that is alluding to is that you're not allowed to bring in a mysterious foreign person and, and pin the crime on them, right? So, um, Jen, are you telling me you, you don't have strolling Indian uh, uh, magicians? Uh, yeah, those are totally legal in the detection club. Just no Chinamen. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. That's a, that's a, that's a Moonstone reference for those of you who haven't read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So I don't I don't know if that answers your question, Carrie. But yes, they they're contemporaries um, and knew one another and and had this had this kind of genre, this golden age of detective fiction. Yeah, I was just thinking about the fact that they both had um, similar time periods, and the and the um, Peter Whimsey was a war. Um, that, but that's, I didn't really have much to add. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad for an excuse to talk about Sarah's. Chad, I don't know if you've read her novels. Um, I think the, the biggest critique of Lord Peter Whimsey is, is that he is, um, you know, a complete top, right? I mean, it, he sprinkles his conversation with his uh, Oxford education. It's part of the delight in reading him for a literature buff like me, but I, I can also imagine it's a little, a little alienating for some. But he has a great driver. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> Anything else? And Letty has a question. I was just wondering how uh, Agatha Christie learned so much about detective work. Um, I know she was a nurse and she was rich and all that, but was there someone that she knew that was a detective at the time that got you know, got her interested in writing mysteries? From my understanding, most of it came from reading mysteries. Um, you know, like, like I said, she was a fan of Wilkie Collins and obviously of uh, Conan Doyle. Um, but uh, as far as that, I mean, I, I've, I've seen some, uh, I, something about how Perot might have been actually inspired by an actual detective, but I, I don't know if that's how, how much I believe that. I don't know. Jen, do you have any? Other information on where her inspirations came from for uh, for getting into detective fiction in particular? Yeah, I no, I mean all of my all of my ideas here are pure speculation. I know that although she was deeply in love with her husband, their marriage was not particularly happy. Um, <laughs> so I think that that might bring one's detecting powers to the fore. Um, she also, as many of you know, disappeared mysteriously for a period and, and returned claiming amnesia, um, you know, total inspiration for the plot of the Outlander novels and series. So, uh, so I, I think, you know, there's, there's certainly elements of mystery in her own life. Um, and, and so I think in a life like that, and then as, as Dr. Martin pointed out, she, um, was a, a slightly awkward introverted person and uh, as, a, as a natural introvert myself, I think, you know, that tends to lead you to be more of an observer, which is, uh, as we see with Paro, uh, the first criteria of a, of a good detective. So mm -hmm. I, I would say certainly elements of her life prepared her to be a mystery novelist. Um, One thing that surprised me when I was looking into her was that she, she was, in, just like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was into spiritualism. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And spiritualism is, was, a, was a big thing, especially after World War I, when you had so many sons that were dead and parents mm -hmm. that wanted to be able to communicate with them. Um, but I, I always find it's very interesting that these people who create characters who are all about observation and logic also have this belief in what we would nowadays consider pretty illogical stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I, I don't know, I just think it's an interesting parallel with her and, and uh, her predecessor, uh, Conan Doyle. You know, what's kind of interesting is, uh, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but you kind of touch on it, is the uh, age of inquiry, uh, you know, age of enlightenment with like Kant and all those was right around that same time frame. And that's really, I see a lot of parallels in the way that these uh, mysteries are actually constructed mm -hmm. and uh, that type of thinking, that type of time period. Well, it, it was also, it was a time period when, um, the industrial, it was what they called the second industrial revolution, which is where things like chemistry and electricity and all that were coming into the fore. You were, you were having houses that had wiring and interior wiring for the first time, that kind of thing. And, and there was this, there was this really progressive belief up to the first world war that technology would, would make life more and more uh, easy and, and, and better. And then the first world war comes along and the same technology that brought you, those things brought you poison gas and flamethrowers and all kinds of horrible stuff too. Um, and, and so that this belief in progress kind of goes by the wayside for a generation or so. But, uh, but I, do, I do find it interesting because there is a kind of a positive a positivity about her detectives. Like the, I, the, I mean, I, I do like the idea that Jen was referring to the rules that they came up with, right? I mean, one of the bedrocks of, of these mystery novels is you can figure out who the killer is. 
You're not, you're, the, 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 there, there's no secret clue that, that, the, that, the, that the investigators have that you yourself aren't given. Mm -hmm. And and because they don't want to have it, they don't want to have a reader who's at the end of the novel is like, well, how the hell was I supposed to figure that out, right? Like there was some secret knowledge that I never had, right? And so, um, and and as a result, she throws a tremendous amount of facts at you, and some of them are irrelevant, and some of them aren't. It's up to you to sift through them and figure out the same way the detectives do. Um, but but there is logic to it, and the and the logic has to make sense. Um, and I think that is a, a, a something from that time period that very much is uh, you know. Uh, the, 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 there aren't a lot of people who act irrationally. There aren't a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, act just kind of capriciously. Uh, the murders have to have a, a motive that, that makes sense to you. Because again, it wouldn't make any sense at the end if, if the killer ended up being some random person who in a fit of rage just killed Mrs. Inglethorpe, you know? It, you, you wouldn't be a satisfying story if that, was the, if that was the case. And so there is this kind of, yeah, like, like you were saying, this kind of age of logic, uh, age of reason, uh, kind of that, that I think by necessity has to be there for a successful mystery. I have a question for the kind of British history part. So one of my other favorite authors is P.G. Woodhouse. Mm. Um, it's kind of a contemporary, but very different genre. Mm -hmm. um, so he has a similar kind of like character and like Birdie is just a dunce, like constantly, you know, just bumbling his way through everything that he encounters and somehow Jeeves always saves him. Mm -hmm. uh, but P.G. Woodhouse spent a lot of time in the United States and kind of moved back and forth. And Agatha's father was American. Like, is that, is there anything to the theory that there's some influence there on why they were more willing to kind of be critical of the upper class than others around them or not? Huh. That's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, America certainly sold itself as a more classless society or a, more of a meritocracy. Um, and, and so unearned wealth, uh, inherited wealth was something that you could, you could as an American, I mean, you know, I, I could, I could, I could see that. <laughs> I don't know that it's true. Jen, do you know, do you have any uh, literary insight on that? Well, this is my big risk in teaching a novel, a 20th century novel. <laughs> Most of my work is the 18th and 19th century. But I do think, as Dr. Martin said in his talk, you also see just this shift post-war, right? That you can't go back. Um, even Downton Abbey has to acknowledge that you can't go back and that that also gets reflected in the literature, even from within the aristocracy. I mean, the P.G. Woodhouse novels are a delight. Um, but of course, they also... I don't know that they're maybe quite as, as critical of Bertie's buffoonery, right? I mean, they sort of embrace it in some ways as, um, as something for us to revel in rather than thinking about how much work he's put on poor Jeeves. And Jeeves, I guess maybe where they are critical is that Jeeves sometimes refuses to help, right? Um, and sort of lets Bertie wend his way through to his own, own solution. But I don't know, I, you know, despite the, the book at the Ganymede Club, I don't, I don't know that um, they ever really think that this isn't what Jeeves should be doing or what, what Bertie should be doing, even though I delight in them. Well, what, one, one thing to note just on the British history side of it is that class relations in Britain right before World War I breaks out are heading to a breaking point. Um, mm -hmm. You've got the three big unions, which were the Teamsters um, and uh, the miners, and yeah. the railway workers were all uh, uh, combining for what was going to be a general strike to shut down the country, um, mostly because of miners' grievances. And, uh, and World War I puts a pause on that, but doesn't put a stop on it. And there is a general strike in the middle of the 1920s, which is vicious. Uh, and the middle classes, people like we read about in this book, actually unite to crush it. Uh, so you have this uh, moment where you have, you know, students from Oxford who are, uh, you know, working on the buses to keep the buses running because the working class bus drivers refuse to work. And the, the working classes really never forgave the middle classes for that. They were like, we, we struck because our working conditions were horrible and our pay was horrible and you middle class twits combined together to, 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 break, to break our unions. 
And um, if you've ever read, and then the Great Depression hits, of course, and the life of the working class gets even worse. So if you've ever read any of Orwell's early stuff, uh, I know most people read Orwell, you know, read uh, 1984 or Animal Farm, but if you read Down and Out in Paris and London or mm -hmm. The Road to Wigan Pier, they're all about like that, that the working classes lived absolutely miserable lives. And I think it became harder to write working class characters as comedy foils when you've got the left book club and people like Orwell saying, you know, I went down into the coal mines. This is the way their life is. I went to these poor villages, these industrial villages during the Great Depression. This is how absolutely destitute and miserable they are. And you can't really, I mean, once, once, once that's been put in, put in front of you, I think it made it a lot harder to have them just kind of be like the foil of, of, of jokes for upper class fobs. Just, just yeah, just to lighten the mood a little bit. I can say that I, I know that um, Dawn has mentioned she's going to read all of uh, Agatha Christie in in order, and I've I've done quite a bit, but now I'm wondering if I've missed some. So thank you, Jim, for posting that, that resource. You can see the changes in in life and the changes in mm -hmm. the concerns of the people in the different classes. You can see some of the things, Chad, that you've talked about as you go through her different novels of, oh, how hard it is to get work. And then uh, the, the debate of going without it as you get later and later and later into the 1900s and what, what to do and, and is it, have we, uh, where are those class lines now and who do I socialize with because I can't afford a servant, but neither can the boss and where does the new boss in the city and their wife stand in relation to me? And you can get a feel of that. <laughs> wow. And that was some of my kids <laughs> and nothing broke apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. So we're not going to launch into the case of the broken crockery where you're going to. Oh, no, 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 no. I, there's a, there, we have, we have a, a routine in here. I go, Vincent, are you okay? Yeah. He goes, I'm okay. And that's how we go. <laughs> we, we clean it up. <laughs> I do love, to your point, Abigail, that um, Styles becomes a nursing home by the end of Poirot's career, right? So we see it move yeah. from Great House to then like many old wonderful estates, it has to have a new life because it, it can't remain what it was, so. The, 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 when I showed you those two photos, uh, the photo of Agatha Christie's later home is obviously a modern color photo because uh, you can go visit it. Um, but uh, the first picture of the home she grew up in, that was demolished. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of those, a lot of those homes are just gone, like, like Dr. Cannon said. I don't remember if it comes up in Christie's novels too much, but it is interesting to track, like, especially in, like, novels and movies, like, the geopolitical influences. So, um, I think it's the Tommy and Tuppence, the first novel, that the Russians are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and you see that, too, like, all like Bond movies and all the things like that you go through series where it's bad guys and then it's Arabs and then it's the Libyan terrorists. Like you go through all of these different genres and then like, I remember not too long ago, we had circled back to Russia. And so like, it, it's interesting to kind of see, depending on where the movies are at, who is being interpreted as the acceptable geopolitical bad guy that you can just say, these are bad people so we can make them the bad guys in our movies and it'll sell and be believable and we don't have to worry about offending anybody because they've they've been tapped as the current bad guy uh, you know i teach a class on uh, the cold war and film mm -hmm. and uh one of the things that i mean uh i forget who there's there's some there's some movie i remember where where somebody comments and says we've never had villains as good as the nazis you know, uh, and, and, it, and it's sort of nostalgic for when we had guys we could just really hate uh, and, you know, kind of Indiana Jones them, just melt them at the end of the movie and nobody cares. Um, but, uh, but, you know, they're, 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 it, it is interesting to see how, uh, uh, you know, different, different groups play out as, as villains in popular culture. Right before Christie's writing this, there, there was a whole genre of anti-German uh, books and plays. One of the one of the, one of the most popular plays 
in the London West End was set in a country house during a German invasion. This, this was, these were, were called the invasion scare uh, works. And it was, it was all about like, uh, remember I said at the beginning of the talk that the, the British had been on top of the world for uh, uh, you know, 99 years, but they, they could tell they were in decline. And the two countries that were sort of breathing down their neck were the United States and Germany. Well, they weren't too concerned about the United States. It was an ocean away and the U.S. didn't really have any ambitions, uh, you know, uh, on, on mm -hmm. British colonies. But, uh, but uh, uh, Germany was considered a very aggressive and threatening country. And so it really did feed into a lot of, starting in the 1890s, you see a lot of these invasion scare um, invasion scare uh, stories where the Germans are going to land troops in Britain and, you know, all these you know, country fops are going to have to go and, and grab their guns and defend their property against them. Um, and in, in the modern day and age, I think one of the, you're, you're just talking about, you know, how they, you, we create villains nowadays in popular culture. One of my favorite stories about that is they, you know, during the Cold War, John Milas did a movie called um, uh, Red Dawn about uh, in the 80s, uh, which is where the Russians invade the United States and they're fighting it out, you know, street to street and it's got Patrick Swayze and it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's whatever it is. But um, they decided they're going to remake it a few years ago. And you're like, how, they, how do you make us um, remake a movie like Red Dawn after the Cold War? Like, who's the villain? And they decided originally to make it the Chinese. And so they, they filmed a whole movie where, because China is one of the only communist, big communist threatening countries left, right? The, the, the Chinese come and invade America. Well, then when they were getting ready to release the movie, the Chinese government said, wait a second, we're the villains in this piece? Forget about it. We're not going to allow this movie to be shown in China if we're the villains. And so they had to go in and digitally alter the uniforms and the flags and the symbols to make the villain North Korea because nobody cares about North Korean movie sales, right? And, and then the movie just becomes ludicrous because, you know, North Korea can barely feed its own people, much less launch a major invasion of the United States. Uh, and so I, I do find it interesting that in the, in, the, in, in the here and now, when we kind of cast about for, for villains in popular culture, how, how we come to the, whatever conclusion we, we do about them. But, but during Christie's, prior to Christie, it would have definitely been the Germans. Like I said, they were, they were, uh, uh, very fearful of the growing power of Germany. So Red Dawn was remade as the mouse that roared? <laughs> I appreciate a Peter Sellers reference when I can get one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my uh, family name actually fell victim to that uh, anti-German fear because my name is actually German, so it should have a C in it. But oh. it was taken out uh, by... My great great grandfather, whoever came over, decided it would be less of a problem to take the C out. I believe it was an intentional misspelling on his part rather than a mistake at Ellis Island. Well, so, during it during makes it look British. Oh yeah, yeah. During World War One, I hell, here in Indianapolis, I actually met a guy whose last name was Messer Smith. Like they changed it from Mr. Schmidt to Messer Schmidt. Um, but, uh, it, you know, during World War I, there was a lot of anti-German feeling in the United States. Um, some of it was, was just kind of crazy. Like they, uh, they renamed sauerkraut victory cabbage. Um, and here in Indianapolis, the uh, Deutsches Bund House or whatever it was, uh, was renamed the Athenaeum. So if you, ever, if you ever go down to Massachusetts Avenue and see the Athenaeum building, that was a, that was a built by Kurt Vonnegut's grandfather, I think, originally designed by him. He was a local architect and it was a German immigrant building. But during World War I, they, they had to change it. Uh, saddest thing I've ever read is that um, patriotic Americans uh, in one city stoned to death some dachshunds because uh, they were considered German dogs. Oh. Um, in Britain itself, the royal family changed its name. Uh, the, it's now, the British royal family is now the House of Windsor, and Windsor was just the name of one of their palaces. Uh, they were uh, Saxe Goburg, uh, I think, um, uh, before that, because uh, Queen Victoria's husband was German, and um, and they changed the name because they couldn't they couldn't very well have a German German sounding royal family if they're fighting the Germans. So yeah, it makes absolutely sense that people would change change their names. Especially when it was their cousin. Right. Yeah. Well, there's that famous picture of, 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 of all the royal families gathered together for Victoria's funeral, and it's you know, Tsar Nicholas and George V and all these guys, and they all look exactly alike because they're all related. 
having oh. giant beards like Alfred Inglethorpe also helps everybody <laughs> look alike. But, I believe when know, they it, identified the remains of the Romanovs, they used Charles' DNA. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And Anastasia's there. She didn't get away. She was shot and killed, and her body was dissolved in acid, just like the rest of them. That's one of my one of the. I, by the way, if you can if you can't tell, my classes are full of very depressing facts. I always I always tell my students when we get to the 20th century, it's pretty grim. So don't expect any happy endings. You know. But these are these are the kinds of things that we can only have perspective on. Like you said, it took about 10 years for those in the trenches to be able to process what's going on and then to be able to really come out with these deeper novels and these more complete works. Um, when I was uh, first out of college working at Rolls-Royce, um, I uh, had a number of people who are were in the civilian life now but were either um, engineers or business people or consultants or customers who were retired military. And I'll never forget this one guy who was just like, look, they told me the, Ru the Russians were the enemies for 30 years of service. They're going to be the enemies for the rest of my life. You know, when you, <laughs> you know, that's, you were in a shooting war. You were in the Cold War. You were in a shooting war. You were in a, action. You were in things you can't talk about. And it does, that sort of thing will, will have this tail effect. Um, and uh, you'll have a variety of people who could process and publish, um, as some of these authors have, and some who, that was, that was their life. You know, trying to tell them it was wrong is like trying to tell someone they are wrong, you know? Well, the, the, interesting thing, the, the interesting thing about Britain in the First World War, though, is that at the end of the war, and if you read the, those novels that I mentioned, you'll see the Germans aren't vilified. The Germans are very much humanized. And there was, there was actually more of a, of a class distinction than a nationalism. Like people blamed nationalism for the war. They're like, we got into this war because of nationalism. And so nationalism was kind of discredited. The war was really, when people look back at it, they're like, why did we bother to fight it? What did it, what did it solve, really? And uh, there was also this idea that, you know, the poor, miserable Germans in their trenches are no better off than the poor, miserable British in their trenches, and their officers are a bunch of aristocratic in in incompetence, and our officers are a bunch of aristocratic incompetence. And so there was, I mean, it, it, if you read the novels and the memoirs, they don't really have the hostility towards the Germans you would think. And in fact, and this is an interesting kind of trivia fact, do you remember all that Rape of Belgium stuff I was showing you, all those posters? Mm -hmm. um, after the war, when people realized that a lot of that was just propaganda that was made up by the British government to make you hate the Germans, um, people had a real distaste for that kind of propaganda, which explains why in World War II, the British really downplayed German atrocities because they knew that the people who had been young in World War I, who were middle-aged in World War II, weren't gonna buy it anymore. And, and it's one of those things that I always tell my students, it's really hard to understand that, you know, like the, the British and the Americans had broken the German codes in World War II and knew about the concentration camps and knew about the Holocaust, but didn't say anything about it, didn't, didn't tell anybody. And, and one of the reasons was because they didn't want the Germans to know they'd broken the codes because the Germans would be like, how the hell did they find out about our camps? Um, but another reason was because they had pushed the anti-German propaganda so hard in World War I, and, it, and a lot of those stories had been proven to be false, they felt like they couldn't go back to the same well in World War I because people would just kind of dismiss it out of hand. They'd be like, what? They're, they're loading people into camps and gassing them? That's outrageous. Who could believe that? This is just like the rape of Belgium stuff. You tried to sell us in World War I. And so, I don't know, it's kind of interesting how, you know, it, it, we often think of history as these discrete moments that happen and then pass, but, you know, they're all related. And people that lived through World War I, lived through the Depression, lived through World War II, lived through the Cold War. I mean, it wasn't like they, they, they only lived these discrete moments. They all inform, one informs the next. Anything one, else? One, one more, a little bit upbeat. <laughs> comment maybe was unrelated to the war but the past is not even past as Faulkner would say <laughs> when uh, Christie was publishing her last Poirot novel and which mm -hmm. of course shock her she kills him off uh, his obituary ran on the front page of the New York Times mm -hmm. and they wrote it straight faced it was just he was, an un, he was of an undetermined age <laughs> they had one of those kind of line drawings of you would have seen in a 19th century, 19th century British paper as the wow. illustration for him. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, Christy, Christy's achievements are, are, are remarkable. The number of languages she was translated into, the number of copies of her books she sold, the, the mousetrap or play was the longest running play in British history then, until it was finally shut down by COVID. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, like, like Jen was saying, uh, she was this introvert, you know, she, she was not set up to be a successful upper middle class woman. She didn't have what it took to be a successful upper middle class woman. And so instead, she built on what she did have to become unique. I mean, there was nobody, I don't, I mean, Jen's the lit person, she could tell you better than I could, but it, I, I can't think of a, a peer from her generation that was as globally successful, certainly not, not, any, not any women from her generation that were as globally successful. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing to me that, that I mean, here we are still reading her stuff. I also, I also find it, it, it's, it's interesting, and again, Jen can talk more about this because it's more of a lit thing, that she took what was really genre fiction and sort of elevated it. You know what I mean? Like we're 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 you have serious discussions about what had been dismissed. I think as as more kind of popular a popular form rather than a serious form. For generations, Jean Le Carré. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, it it could only happen in a COVID world. My neighbor's cat has found its way into our house, and so I have to mask up. So. Um, I think that's probably a, a good time to end it with the mousetrap being closed <laughs> to COVID <laughs> and, um, and with a recognition of Agatha Christie's kind of amazing achievement as a woman novelist um, uh, and a, a kind of figure who defined a genre, uh, even though Auden never gave her credit in his essay oh, that we last week. So thank you all so much for, for coming, for the great questions. Thank you, Dr. Martin, as always, for giving us a lively look at the past context. So if, if everyone wants to unmute just for a moment so we can return to a semblance of normalcy and applaud Dr. Martin, I think that would be <laughs> a nice thing to do. And then we can, we can sign off. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll say your applause are, are, are wonderful, uh, but I'll also remind Dr. Camden that she now owes me two beers. I do. Uh, faculty are paid in drink, um, and I, I'm in justice to Dr. Martin. <laughs> Thank you all. Have Thank a you. wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job.